He loved hymns. He loved old hymns. And we sang them all the time. And this is one that he really liked. Mm -hmm. pardon for all my sins and then he gives a peace that endureth the Thanks to all of you coming today. Welcome to the Pentecostals of Alexandria and welcome to the home going of one of the greatest men of the gospel that's ever walked the face of this earth, our beloved <laughs> Brother Tina. <clears throat> I will read my best to read to you word for word the obituary I have before me. Though neither Tom nor Fred made the top 20 names for baby boys in the year 1933, in a house on Pine Street in DeRitter, Louisiana, the decision was made and the birth certificate details filled in. He would be Tom Fred Tenney. He would belong to the ages they didn't know that Wednesday, December the 6th, 
1933, just what a world changer had come to be part of the Tenney household. Time alone would tell. One thing that was firmly established that day and held true 84 plus years of his life was this simple truth. Louisiana would always be his home. He was raised in a Christian household, though of another denomination than the one to which he would devote his career. And that change happened at age 16. He snuck off to hear someone of another faith tell their story, and he left with a story of his own. T.F. Tenney was destined for greatness that few in our generations would achieve, and he couldn't wait to get started. Things were different back in 1949. A 16-year-old new convert could strike out preaching, could marry the girl of his dreams, and get elected pastor at his first church by age 19. It didn't take long for the gift that was inside him to make room for itself. Not only did this gifting and anointing bring him before great men, as promised in Proverbs, it also made him a great man. The phone would ring and off he would go. Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, then around the United States and around the world for over six decades of ministry. From conferences and crusades to small and large local churches in Louisiana and across our nation, His preaching was anointed, life-changing, and certainly memorable. Countless messages are watched and re-watched, never once without impacting the listener with pure anointing, a keen insight into the scripture, a remarkable story, or those unforgettable quips and quotes, his brilliant mind, his eloquence in the pulpit, His love for God and people cannot be matched. He was a prolific writer, authoring 12 books with a 13th in process at the time of his demise. He was a wordsmith extraordinaire and the master of one-liners. Though he was well into his 80s, T.F. Tenney's Twitter account lists his current number of followers at more than 44,000. By virtue of his calling and his remarkable gifting, Brother Tenney served in administrative ministry, holding elected and appointed offices from 1952 until his death. The work was secondary to the ministry as he was one of the most gifted and sought after conference and camp meeting speakers. He was a minister and an administrator, and it was always in that order. He served as Louisiana District, Youth Secretary from 1952 through 1954, and then became Louisiana Youth President in 1954 and served until 1960. And he became International Youth President in 1960 and served until 69. During this time, the Louisiana District held its first youth camp and set an example that other districts would soon follow. It was under his administration at the international level that Bible quizzing was developed. The first youth convention was held, and the magazine for apostolic youth titled The Conqueror's Tread was created. From 1970 until 1975, Brother Tenney served as international director of foreign missions. It was during his tenure in this office that much progress was made on behalf of global evangelism. The partner in missions program was launched. The school of missions was begun. Short-term evangelistic policies and programs were implemented. Field conferences and regional conferences for missionaries were established. The fields were opened up for more participation from pastors and evangelists to make overseas trips and assist in the work. He may have traveled the world and loved almost every minute of it, but as is pretty much always the case with a true Louisianan, when the call came from De Ritter, his home church, to see if they were interested in coming home to pastor, well, Louisiana folks always want to go home. So back to De Ritter, they came. And it was during this time frame that for a short period of time, he served as the radio voice of the United Pentecostal Church International to the world, serving as the speaker for Harvest Time and international radio broadcast. The summer of 1978, with the untimely death of our then district superintendent, 
C.G. Weeks. T.F. Tenney was first appointed to serve as interim district superintendent, then elected as district superintendent, a position that he continued to hold through May the 1st, 2005, at which time he retired and took on the role of Bishop Emeritus of the Louisiana District United Pentecostal Church. Believing and demonstrating that his retirement was actually refirement, T.F. Tenney continued to travel and preach and teach from here to Yon. Long after some may have thought he should be staying home, he was traveling to China and Chile and the regions beyond, as well as booking almost every available weekend stateside. In the last couple of years, when his physical condition became serious enough to affect his travel, it was only with great reluctance that he allowed his calendar to be cleared, at which point he joined the staff here at the Pentecostals of Alexandria. A preacher has to preach. A minister has to minister. He would remind us of what happened to Jonah. A preacher that doesn't preach gets so rotten that even an oversized fish can't stand him. <laughs> Thetis Tenney, his wife of almost 66 years, is left to cherish his memory along with his son, Tommy Tenney, whose wife, Jeannie, you just heard sing. His daughter, Terry Spears, and husband, Steve. The Tenney's grandchildren will not soon forget their beloved Papa. Shane Spears and wife, Taryn. Tiffany Tenney, Shannon Spears, Natasha Tenney, and Andrea Tenney Lavispear, her husband, Craig. The greats were his delight and will well remember this gentle giant. They're Brooklyn McFarlane, Braxton McFarlane, Caitlin McFarlane, Kristen McFarlane, Seth Spears, Eli Spears, Zoe Harris, Zach Spears, and Sam Spears. Reverend Tenney is also survived by his only sister, Nelda Frazier, who is unable to be here today, but sends her love. His life and ministry touched the lives of a host of friends and fellow ministers who were honored by his presence in their lives, none more than we of the Louisiana district. Our district will not be the same without him. Camp meeting will be just a little bit off kilter this year. We'll miss his tweets, his text, his shout. We'll miss those timely place phone calls and the knowledge that he was praying for us. It is true what I said about folks from Louisiana. There's something in us that when we get away sooner or later, we just want to go home. So Friday afternoon, surrounded by his family and with Pam Noel standing close by too, he found out what going home really means. At so many funerals, he would ask the rhetorical question, what must it be like? Well, he found out. When the last breath at 2.05 p.m. became the first deep, clear breath of celestial air. And he said, finally, I'm home. That was our brother Tenney. I personally had the re wonderful responsibility of getting to work alongside brother Tenney for seven years. As district secretary in the final seven years of his being district superintendent. I wouldn't trade those seven years for anything. I loved every bit of it. Today, our governor, John Bell Edwards, ordered the flags at our state capitol building to be flown at half mast to recognize and pay respect to our leader, Reverend T.F. Tenney. What an honor. I personally stand here tonight having lost a pastor, a spiritual advisor, and a consultant in T.F. Tenney. But what I expect is that there are many more in here tonight that if you were to be honest, Sister Tenney, if I had them raise their hands, they'd go up all over this building that said he was my pastor, he was my mentor, he was my advisor. That was Brother Tenney. If I had the time, and it's already taken me just 10 minutes to read the obituary, if I could go on for hours, I promise I will not. Telling stories of our times together.
because we ate together, we laughed together, we worshiped together. As the writer of the book of Hebrews stated in verse 32, and what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of. So many times at funerals, I've heard a remark from the speakers talking about whoever was there before them. When they get to heaven, they're going to try to find Abraham and David or Peter or Paul. You know what I'm saying. And I want to find them and talk to them. I agree with that. No problem. But as of a couple days ago, Kevin Cox's opinion, Abraham and David and Peter and Paul were huddled together saying, reckon when we can find time to get in that line to talk to T.F. Tenney. Sister Tenney, we we lost a bishop. We lost a great superintendent, missions director, internationally known speaker, you name it. We lost that. You didn't lose that. You lost your wonderful companion, your best friend. I know them were pain you feel because of that. I also know that you were right alongside him. Every one of those positions that he so ably and powerfully and wonderfully served. And I commend you for that. I know particularly in raising your children at home, there undoubtedly were many times that you kissed him goodbye as he headed out to fly. And even in the later years, whether it be overseas or somewhere else. But just a few days ago, your beloved, our brother Tenney, but your beloved finally made good on a one-way ticket that he bought at age 16. We're not going to see him anymore on this earth. But what a day it's going to be when we join him in heaven. Our prayers are with you. God bless you. T.F. Tinney was a leader a preacher, a mentor. As a leader, he innovated. As a preacher, he inspired. As a mentor, he invested. We all know the wit and wisdom of T.F. Tinney. We can all remember the unique quip, the inspired phrase, the profound thought, the memorable idea. And today I'm representing thousands of ministers who have a testimony just as much as I would have, but let me share my version on their behalf. Uh, Every one of them thinks they had a very special connection with Brother Tinney, and they did. Of course, I know I had a special connection. (laughs) You see, the first thing is that I was from Louisiana, and he always wanted to invest in preachers from Louisiana. Second thing, I was a missionary kid. My dad served under his leadership. In fact, I remember when I was just a young teen, a preteen, and he was the youth president. He took a world tour in 1969, came to Korea, one of only three visits that entire five-year term from America uh, for the She's for Christ drive. That was the purpose, and, and so that's my fir- first recollection of Brother Tenney as the youth president. Then, of course, the end of that year, he was elected as foreign missions director and served in that capacity. I remember the interest he took in me as a young minister. It's amazing in retrospect that I was a lowly associate editor. He asked me to come to the Louisiana District Conference and speak an evening service on the doctrine of the new birth. And then, of course, when we started Urson Graduate School of Theology, he was a strong supporter because he believed in apostolic scholarship. And, of course, Sister Tinney, you are a partner in that endeavor, and I still appreciate the strength and support that both Brother and Sister Tinney gave. Later, I had the privilege of serving with him on the general board when he was still district superintendent. On every issue, he could bring an amazing historical perspective going back to the 60s, 70s, all the way up, tell you exactly why, when, and how, and give you insight for today and tomorrow. And then when I became general superintendent, he was an honorary board member, and he was quite an encourager, quite a supporter. He always wanted to help. He always wanted to advance the kingdom of God. 
I remember just a, a few years ago when we were discussing the relocation of world headquarters, that was quite an event, and he was for it, but he wanted to make sure we covered all the bases. So we told the story of when A.T. Morgan, general superintendent in 1967 from Louisiana, was addressing the general board and uh, suddenly died of a heart attack. And there were some conspiracy theories that he was going to uh, announce a new doctrine or something like that. But Brother Tenney had the, the right story. He knew the inside scoop. He was going to talk about the relocation of world headquarters, and he knew how challenging that would be. And so Brother Tenney just wanted me to know as general superintendent, <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> There's some precedent here. But as long as you know what you're doing, as long as you've got your plan, then I'm for you. I just want to make sure you've got it covered. Even in the last couple of years, he talked to me about his desire for the work of God in Calcutta, India. I want to make sure that I, as general superintendent, would personally be involved in that and make sure it went according to plan and didn't fall by the wayside. He was one of the key leaders of the United Pentecostal Church International who has shaped who we are today. We now have about 4 million, 4 million constituents, 225 nations and territories around the world, 41,000 congregations, in great measure due to people like Brother Tenney, the leaders of his generation, have shaped who we are today. But far beyond the UPCI, he was also an apostolic Pentecostal ambassador. One little interesting story, uh, when I was working under Brother Hall, our editor-in-chief, we had an occasion to communicate with one of the leading Southern Baptist theologians. And he had written a book that was amazing in describing the doctrine of God in essentially the same ways as one is Pentecostals. So we wanted to talk to him, and we asked him if anybody else uh, believed the way he did, if he had encountered any others. And, and uh, he said, well, when I was pastor of the Baptist church in DeRitter, Louisiana, there was a, a young boy, I believe he baptized him in the Baptist church. And he said later he joined a Pentecostal church. He became one of those Pentecostal preachers. And we did talk about the doctrine of God. And yes, I think he and I would agree on the doctrine of God. Of course, that was T.F. Tenney. You never knew where his name or his influence would pop up when you talk theology, when you talk the world Christian movement. I will say this, probably my most vivid recollection the last few years is when Brother Tenney had the closing remarks at the funeral of James Kilgore, one of his closest friends. I was deeply stirred. I saw Brother Tenney become very passionate, and he went far beyond the memorable phrase into deep conviction, and he quoted, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, I wanted to make sure that was quoted over my friend because that's what he gave his life to. And then, of course, I'm paraphrasing as I remember it. He said, who will pick up this mantle? That touched me deeply. And you know, I feel the same way today. There's no one here that can take the place of T.F. Tenney. However, we can because he taught us that we can take this Jesus name, Holy Ghost message everywhere and we can change our world. I was only 27 years old, and Brother Tenney was 34 years old when he asked me to come work for him at World Evangelism Center. And uh, I'm supposed to represent the day today the old friends. And it's been long enough that I guess 50 years or so that we can certainly classify as old friend Sister Tenney. And uh, today we want to honor a longtime friendship it was a step of faith for each of us. 
because Brother Tenney didn't know Sue and myself, <clears throat> but this was the beginning of a long and trusting relationship and a respect for each other. Any major move or change in our lives from that time on was always filtered and blessed by the one so many relied on, Brother T.F. Tenney. One of my first assignments from Brother Tenney was to purchase a camera. He said, I don't know anything about taking pictures, but I want you to buy me a camera <clears throat> that uh, I can use to go around the world on a mission trip and take good pictures. So the Instamatic Kodak cameras had just come out. And uh, I fixed him up with that and plenty of film. And, and on that world round trip, he uh, took great pictures, enough that we developed our first She's for Christ film strip from the pictures he had taken of going around the world. Brother Tenney also showed great interest and concern for each of our children and grandchildren. He would always ask how Brad and Marcia were doing always remembered their names. Because of the love we all felt for the Tennies, our entire family loved them so much. I realized that this type of caring was repeated over and over in the lives of all who are here today. We all felt like we were special to Brother Sister Tenney. He made each of us feel that way. I know you've had similar circumstances that you could relate to as well. Although there are many friends and relationships that we have experienced through the years, there was a special bond that developed many years ago when seven ladies pledging their care and encouragement to, Jer to Jerry Glass, who was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and this group continued to pray and express concern for each other through those years. Those ladies were and are Lorraine Gustafson, Edith Tenney, Billy Lambert, Sissy Rodenbush, Jerry Ann Gidrose, Shirley Welch, and my wife, Sue. And after they had plenty of time to get together and talk and pray and whatever, they decided maybe they could include their husbands in their gatherings. And uh, we were included. <clears throat> Became a very compatible group of friends who made time in busy schedules to spend quality time together. That was not always easy, but it was a choice we made. It was a wonderful time of relaxing. We could be laughing one moment and crying the next. We quickly became old friends. We vacationed together many times. Sometimes it was just spending an extra couple of days after general conference. Sometimes it was a cruise where Brother Tenney and I kept the ice cream machine busy. <laughs> Then there was Branson, which he enjoyed, and where we met many times together, our last time being just after the conference last year. What wonderful memories we have. We all looked up to the Tennies as our mentors and dear friends. At the close of any get-together, whether on a cruise ship, in a hotel room, or at a condo in Branson, Brother Tenney would arrange for a place to meet where we all shared our hearts and prayed for each other and our families. We'll never forget those special moments, is not he? Sue and I feel especially blessed because the Tennies have a second home in Branson and they would come there two or three times a year, sometimes for extended stays. <clears throat> years ago, we could never have dreamed that we would be together in the same town enjoying our older years and having some fun times. When they were in town, we kept busy almost every day doing something. Brother Tenney would say, Sue, what are we doing tomorrow? Or we'll come by for coffee about four tomorrow, or you can come over to our place. Or he'd say, I want to eat at Olive Garden while we're here. And uh, we would. And we could be out driving, and uh, suddenly he would say, Maybe we ought to swing by Andy's frozen custard. <laughs> and we would. <laughs> he always wanted to take us to dinner, somewhere really special, before they left town, to show appreciation and thank us for our time together. We will miss those times, and it's very difficult to grasp that he won't be coming back again. Sister T, as I affectionately call you, 
We had birthdays on the same day, I think. You're not much older, are you? Sister T, I know I speak for thousands of others when I say, please know that we will continue our support of you, even though the bishop will not be with us. We will talk and reminisce about the good times we had together and share sweet memories. And yes, there will be tears, lots of tears. It will be hard for, for you to return to Branson without him, but please do come back as often as you can. Tommy and Jeannie, Terry and Steve, we love you as family. and We're praying for you during this transition. He loved you and those grands and great grands so much and talked often about you all. Anytime Sue would take a picture of he and Sister Tenny or with pictures they were in, he'd say, Sue, send that to me. He wanted to share it with his family. You were never far from his thoughts. We all just wanted him to stay with us forever and are not sure how or what we'll do without him. His imprint will forever, forever be all over our lives. His voice admonishing, but mostly encouraging us to carry on. Brother T will be forever, forever love you and hold you up as an exemplary Christian, a man highly revered and loved. Your departure has made our eyes dim with tears. We miss you already, old friend. But we will meet again and resume our friendship over there. We'll pick up where we left off. Brother Tenney was my loyal friend and mentor for more than 50 years. He was also general director of Global Missions while we were serving as missionaries. I'm going to focus on that part of our friendship today. It was in 1969 and we were already missionaries in West Africa, living and serving in starting churches, when we got the news that the retiring youth director was elected as the foreign missions director. As a young missionary, I was so thrilled at the thought of a young visionary leader who I believed could take us to new levels in missions work, and he did just that. Under his leadership, he and his team totally changed the face and the image of foreign missions. When we were appointed as missionaries in 1969, the general concept of missionary work was a penny march on Sunday morning during Sunday school. And whatever came in that month, they would get it together and share it with the missionaries overseas. Brother Tenney began immediately to lift the image of the ministry of a missionary to a higher level. He promoted missionaries as heroes of the faith and world changers. He felt missionaries should be honored and provided for, and he was going to do everything he could to honor and provide. Under his leadership, Faith Promise concept of giving was launched, and he promoted Faith Promise missions conferences across North America, and missions giving began to soar, breaking giving records every year. He and Brother Edwin Judd together launched the Partners in Missions program, which has proven to be one of the greatest blessings to the missionary outreach worldwide. He started the Overseas Ministries Department to coordinate literature and the importance of training worldwide. And at this time, I believe there are nearly 500 training programs overseas today because of the emphasis that he gave. He initiated the regional director program, appointed four regional directors because he realized one man could really not coordinate everything worldwide. What a blessing that was. 
Further, Brother Tenney launched a worldwide revival emphasis. Money was raised at general conferences for crusades worldwide, and two of those crusades were held in Ghana, and the late G.A. Mangan came along with Kenneth Phillips. And in those days, for 900 people to get the Holy Ghost in just a few nights was unheard of. It was the beginning of a worldwide revival that continues on today. Those were the days of the evangelists, Billy Cole, Leo Upton, and the Doyle Spears family. Steve, the people around the world still talk about your preaching and your singing. Thank you. It was also under Brother Tenney's leadership, along with S.W. Chambers, that the World Conference Fellowship was conceived and has now become, Brother Bernard, the global council that includes national leadership from all over the world. And all of this was accomplished in a little less than six years. Amazing and incredible that one man could be given the gift to lead and to encourage each one of us to do more to reach the world with the apostolic message. Today, we have our general director, Bruce Howe, and our retired director, Harry Sism. Both of these men have served well. There are many men here who are members of the Global Missions Board. Many missionaries and retired missionaries are here today to the great fellowship of the United Pentecostal Church. Thank you, Louisiana, for sharing T.F. Tenney with us. And thank you, Sister Tenney. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Terry, for sharing the man of God with the whole wide world. Before I begin my remarks this evening, I just think it's right to express gratitude to Pastor Anthony and Mickey Mangan and the Pentecostals of Alexandria for the way they have put this together in such short order. And you've put heart and energy and effort, and we thank you. We thank you. I'm honored that Brother Tenney uh, planned his own memorial service. I'm not surprised because he always had a plan for anything and everything, but I'm thankful that he is allowing me to be a part of it. The challenge is this man literally wrote the book on funerals. It is the other black book that pastors go to when they need a funeral thought, and here we are trying to honor the man who wrote the book on funerals. So I'm simply going to say that Genesis 6-4 has an opening phrase where it states, there were giants in the earth in those days. And if ever that can be spoken about someone, I will tell you there was a giant in the earth in these days, and it was Tom Fred Tenney. <clears throat> I had, Melanie and I had been in DeRitter assisting there at that church, and of course, that was our introduction to the Louisiana district. We had crossed the Sabine from Texas. And after our time there, we were moving back to Texas, and in 1990, during youth camp, in fact, I was speaking at one of the camps here on the campgrounds, that golf cart began to make its way around that Brother Tenney always drove, and I heard a voice saying, Brother Scott, have you got a minute? And first I thought, dear God, what have I done? <laughs> and then I said, yes, sir, and I got on the golf cart, and I had a golf cart invitation to serve him as his administrative assistant. I did not have to pray about it. We literally never discussed money. The answer was just 
Absolutely yes. I could not believe I had such an opportunity. In reflection, I was 24 years old. And he was 56. I'm here tonight and I'm 52. And I've got on the front row here my 16-year-old daughter and my 22-year-old son and my 29-year-old wife. (laughs) But I marvel that a 56-year-old man, because at that time he was so old and wise and seasoned and experienced, and especially when I consider where I am and I'm still a kid trying to find my car keys and my way through life. We were here a few weeks ago, the family, Spencer, Savannah, Melanie, and myself. I had that inclination. I didn't like the inclination but I knew we had a small window and we came and spent the day. We toured the campgrounds. He insisted, he wanted, he and Sister Tenny, we, every square inch, we covered it all. We talked, we showed them the house we lived in. We covered it, everything. And then of course we went back to their house. My kids got to sing for Brother Tenny and Sister Tenny and speak. And of course they prayed and all that. But there was a conversation between Spencer and Brother Tenney, and as they were speaking, it struck me, and I realized that as 22 and myself at 52, that was about what we had going in 1990 when I came to work for Brother Tenney. That was the dynamic. He told me when he, when he hired me, he said, son, normally I would pick someone at least a decade older than you. But I'm doing this intentionally. He said, I need to be around your generation. He said, I'm hiring you because I want you to sharpen me while I sharpen you. I came out on the better end of that deal. First day on the job, his words were, son... We got a tiger by the tail, grab hold anywhere you can and hang on. (laughs) The very first weekend I worked for him, the very first weekend I was working for him, I drove him to one of the small Pentecostal churches that I had not heard of here in Louisiana. And right off the bat, I offended the pastor and his wife. I, I, didn't, I, I was 24. I did not mean to. I'm a third-generation Pentecostal. I have seen it. I've experienced it. I, nothing rattles me. But what took me by surprise is that it was the Sunday morning service. And everybody knows Pentecost happens at Sunday night. So that part had me for a little bit of a loop, but then it was also the very first song, and, and all they said was, well, good morning and praise the Lord, and immediately people started running and shouting, and, and we had, it was Sunday morning, and we had just started, and I just leaned over to Brother Tenney, and I said, wow, these folks love to run. And I didn't know the pastor's wife heard me. I was supposed to be sharpening him, And I did not know that story until years later that he fixed that one for me, and I'm grateful. (laughs) I have learned more about homiletics. I have learned more about preaching, though I, not even in his ballpark, from this man than from any college course, any workshop I've ever taken. He let me as a 20-something, study with him and for him on his sermons. You know, a lot of pastors and preachers protect their source. They, They tell you they got it at the getting place. They... They forget that Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, and and, and they, they hold on to it. And I can appreciate that, but this man took on the role of Jesus, the ultimate mentor, who let his disciples gather fish and bread 
and bring it to him. And then he would, of course, do the multiplication and the miracle. Brother Tenney would do that. He did the blessing, the dividing, and the multiplying. But he let this lad gather loaves and fish and present it to him to see what he could do with it. He'd let me work one time for a general conference sermon. And he, he would open that district office door. It had a bell attached. I don't know if it still does or not. But it, the first thing you'd hear is the bell. Ding-a-ding-a-ding. And then the next thing you'd hear is, Pam! <laughs> and then sometimes, Scott! And we'd gather. But he told me, Son, I'm going to preach on Jacob. I'm going to preach on Jacob. And I, I want to cover how he deceived his father with the hair of a goat, and I'm going to call it a feel for the real. And then he said, get me everything you can on it. What a rush. <laughs> so I took my CD-ROM <laughs> that was our only Bible software program, plugged it in, and for a couple of days, I worked and I studied and, and I finally printed five pages of anything that stood out to me in that story. And I presented it to him. And he sat in his rocking chair and he began to read. And he'd read. And he'd read. And then he'd check to Mark. General Conference, I don't remember what year it was. But I will tell you this, he was preaching to thousands, and one of my points <laughs> made it. The crowd was on their feet, heaven kissed earth. And at about 24, that was the first general conference I ever preached. I knew then I'm on my way. But he let me be a part of the miracle. He was an avid reader. He'd read anything. In fact, his idea of unwinding was when he would just read the National Geographic. Constant student, Mont Blanc pen in his hand, reading, and he would do check marks if he liked a sentence or a paragraph, and then give Pam the book and type out the parts that I like. And, and he told me, son, read anything and everything. And when you read a book, take with you two tools. You need a shovel and you need a pitchfork. Some things you dig into, some stuff you pitch. But there's always something good. In fact, he's the one that stressed to me that a man who won't read has no advantage over a man who can't read. He'd listen to sermons from people from all walks of life and denominations. He wanted the pastors and the ministers of the Louisiana district to be readers, to be well-read, to be growing in knowledge. Every sectional meeting, every sectional banquet, we would load the Acts 238 mobile <laughs> with books. And we would go to every one of those events pushing people to read, to grow. Brother Anthony and I were talking about this. Brother Cox and I talked about this. We're a f There's a few of us men who have been, been privileged to have two spiritual fathers. And next only to my father, this man has influenced and molded my life like no other. He has admonished me he has coached me. He has chided me. He has challenged me. And he has always loved me and had my back. He told me, son, I'm going to give you 100 things to do. You'll do 99 right. I'll see the one you did wrong. Boy, he prophesied that one correctly. <laughs> there was a giant in our land. He was the king of the one-liners. When he, I pushed him to get on Twitter. I was one of many I knew when this man goes on Twitter. Long before Twitter, he was tweeting. 
He could talk up with presidents and senators and governors and statesmen. And then he could transition into the language of every man and let you know that I'm a farm boy who knows which end of the cow gets up first. His leadership and his diplomacy were second to none. His passion for the word and the ministry of the word was unparalleled. In fact, in his last days, he, he struggled with a cloud of depression and, and he expressed it to us and I know he told others. He said, I'm, my struggle is two things. Number one is because I can't see well enough to read and I, I miss reading. And then secondly, I'm not getting to preach and son, the fire is still in me. He texted me one day recently and said, if you can, sneak up on the Lord and ask him, why is he slowing me down so soon? I've been with him at the White House. I've been with him on the Senate floor. I've been in the governor's mansion, and I've been in nursing homes. I've been to hog scaldings, <laughs> which if you don't know what that is, that's a church business meeting. I've watched him deal firm, deal firm grace with someone who has fallen morally. I've seen him go the second mile to make sure restoration was done right. He'd stand toe to toe with anyone, anywhere. One time there was a man who was running for governor here who had been I won't mention his name because Brother Tenney was very diplomatic, but I will tell you this man's background had in it white sheets and burning crosses, and yet he declared that he was intolerant in his youth, but he had converted, and he came to the office, and why Brother Tenney let me in on that meeting, I don't know, but I, I was quiet and I was listening, and Brother Tenney just looked right through and said, talk to me about your conversion. So you've converted. Tell me about your conversion. And of course it was vague. And then he asked, who's your pastor? And this man, this candidate said, oh, well, my, the pilot I have is a retired minister and that's my pastor. And he said, son, he's, he's not a pastor, he's a pilot. And he finally said, we don't endorse anyone and I, I'm not going to endorse you, but I want to pray for you. And I watched him lay hands on that man and say, Lord... Only you and this man know his heart, and I'll let you deal with that. And he prayed over a man, and I just knew again, I'm with a giant in the land. If, if Muhammad Ali was the king of the rope -dope, dope and the ring, my mentor was the king of the rope dope and the boardroom. You couldn't put him in a corner. That Acts 238 mobile... I've driven it on interstates and I've driven it on red dirt roads. He never needed a map to any Pentecostal church in Louisiana. It didn't matter how many cattle guards you crossed. He knew where the church was and he knew somebody in that church. And he liked to give directions. Anyone who's driven him knows. If you picked him up at his house to drive to the tabernacle, he'd tell you, turn here. You're going to want to turn here. I said, yes, sir, I live here. But I got to tell you about those license plates. Acts 238 will get you a lot of places. And in the state of Louisiana, the only thing better than that license plate would be to have red and blue lights on your car. Because we could move. And I've been stopped a few times and I've had more than one officer give me my driver's license back and just say, well, listen, let me encourage you to slow down and tell Reverend Tenney I said hello. I missed that when the gig was up. <laughs> it didn't work the same. He was an ambassador, not just to his fellowship, but to the body of Christ. He loved to go to the National Bro Religious Broadcasters Convention. He and Brother G.A. Mangan would go together. And Sister Vesta doesn't need to know this, but the first thing that Brother G.A. would do is at the airport stop and buy all the candy he could. And... <laughs> Say, don't tell Lane. 
But I've seen men who have worldwide known ministries stop and hug and say, Tom Fred. And he hugged them and I realized they knew one another by name. He loved me and mine as if we were his own. My kids were privileged to call him Papa Tenny and Mimi Tenny. They've sung for him and loved on him. And of course, they have prophesied and imparted and prayed over my kids. We're rich. We are rich in love and legacy. He nicknamed Melanie Sunshine. One thing that happened while we were, again, we were a young couple, is we discovered while working at the district office that we had fertility challenges. We didn't know that. And so the good doctors here in Rapids Parish had us working on rhythms and schedules. And so sometimes I'd have to leave the office. Because faith without works is dead. (laughs) And Brother Tenny got the biggest kick out of that. Sometimes I'd say, well, I need to head home to the C.G. Weeks house, which I hope they've remodeled. And this giant could get a boyish grin. Scott! Yes, sir. Where are you going? (laughs) And he'd just smile. A little while later, I'd come back to work, and he'd just look at me and say, Well? (laughs) His passion and his fire never waned. In fact, he texted me last fall, and he said, The doctors tell me I've got to lay low for 90 days, and I can't travel. Don't tell Thetis but I'm gonna fudge on that timeline. T.F. Tenney was the closest to being omniscient of anyone I know. He just knew. He knew. He knew what you were doing. He knew where you were. He knew what you did not want him to know. I attended an unsanctioned event one time just for a look-see, and before I started my car to leave, the phone rang, and he said, what are you doing there? How do you know? Another time I conducted a board meeting, and we dismissed the board meeting, and I loaded the car, and as I was leaving, he called, and he just started right out and said, he said, why didn't you talk to him about adjusting the budget? And I'm like, how, how do you know we were talking about a budget? I've seen him approach young pastors and ministers and just say, hey, you know what you're doing. Stop it. And I don't know if the young minister knew what he was or wasn't doing, but I promise you he stopped something. I want to conclude, a lot of great men of God have come, lived their life, they have impacted the world, and then they've gone to their reward. They raised up sons in the Lord, but it ends there. I could name names of powerful ministries, strong, strong ministries, apostles, You think of their name, you hear their name, and it'll conjure up just a sense of awe. But when they died, it died with them. Because many great ministerial legacies, many great apostles, when that father passed from the scene, I believe what it was is they found so much fulfillment in the ground they covered and their anointing and their gifting That while they raised up sons, when they are gone, their sons don't know how to father. Their sons are still sons. So the legacy ends. Maybe that's why Paul said the ratio is about 10,000 instructors 
to not many fathers. We have a great disparity, a lot of instruction versus those who will let you do it and let you learn. T.F. Tenney did not father sons. He fathered fathers. He taught us how to become fathers. There's a difference. His legacy will live on because what he had, he imparted to us. And he made room for other men and women to father and mentor others. He told me, Pam can attest to this, that God would often give him a funeral message before a key death. I've seen it happen. God would put an impression on him. He would literally craft a message. And then there would be a key death in the organization or in Louisiana. And he knew, now I know that message was for this death. I've witnessed it many times. I was in Canada, in British Columbia, in fact, on the day that Brother Tenney passed. Due to the time difference, I was asleep just about five hours before he had passed. I knew he had, uh, about his situation, Sister Tenney and I were talking. But he came to me in a dream on the morning of his passing. He was strong. He had that fire and fervor like we've seen in the pulpit. And he was admonishing me. And he looked right at me and he said, Scott, you have got to revive your passion for fervent prayer. It is the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. And then he told me, use the name. Exercise your authority in the Holy Spirit. Son, you've got it. Now use it. I woke up. And about two hours later, I had a text. He had passed. And for me, it was just a moment of realizing my mentor had something to say to me as he was in transition. And all the great saints of Louisiana and all the great pastors and the men, of the women, men and women of God of this, this organization and this district, we can all say, there was a giant among us. But he has still given us that fervency in prayer, the power of the name of Jesus, and our authority in the Holy Ghost. To the children, I've learned this. If you're going to bury your father, you have to dig very deep. To the grands and to Sister Tenny, your loved one, He's no longer constrained by time and space. He's with the movers and shakers. He's literally a Louisiana phrase. He's in high cotton. It's called the great cloud of witnesses. He has influence like he's never had influence. He's close by where there's intercession being made day and night. And I will tell you, He'll talk to you more than he's ever talked to you. He'll show up. Sister Mangan and I were talking. You'll catch a smell of something, and it'll make you realize he's here. You'll hear a song, and you'll know he's here. He can do more for you now than he ever could before. Now in heaven, there is a giant among them. I honor the memory of my mentor. Do you have Tenny? Thank you. When peace lies
Jesus with me right now. Would you give him great glory and honor? Oh, he's worthy of praise tonight. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Name above every name. We honor you tonight. We love you tonight. We love you, Jesus. You may be seated. It's an extreme, extreme honor to 
be here tonight. I, I think I'm the only speaker so far who was not born out of this church and out of this movement. I know he loved you, but he loved me too. He loved me, and he loved many like me that I represent. And that man changed my life. There's a scripture in uh, Genesis 49 and verse 22. The old man Jacob is calling his boys in and laying hands on them, speaking prophetic blessing that would follow them the rest of their life. And he gets to Joseph and he says three things about Joseph. He says, Joseph, you are a fruitful bough or garden. And then he said, buy a whale. And then the third thing, and he said, and your vines will go beyond the walls. And I thought about T.F. Tenney. Many years ago, he found a whale, not multiple whales. He's taught me whale. There's one whale, and that whale is Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other way. There's no other message but Jesus. And when he found that whale, he couldn't keep it to himself. And God said to Joseph, because you went beyond the walls, you could have stayed in your garden, and it's the most amazing garden, but you couldn't stand it knowing that there were people on the outside who had never tasted living water, who had never experienced power and anointing like you take for granted. And he said, I must go beyond the walls. And God told Joseph, and I believe it's a word for many of you here today because there's a lot of Josephs in this room. He said, because of that, I'm going to give you double. You'll have two tribes. All the other boys had one tribe, but you'll have two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Tom, T.F. Tenney, Bishop T.F. Tenney had two tribes. He had a tribe inside the walls, and he loved and honored his amazing, amazing church. I have nothing but respect for you. I have nothing but honor and amazement at the beauty of what God is doing inside these walls. But there's also another tribe that he had outside these walls. And for some reason, Thetis, one day when I didn't know the storm that was coming to our life, Brother Tenney threw a, a vine over the wall and he made his way to Georgia and my wife, who is sitting on that front row at a time when we wouldn't have a ministry today. I wouldn't have a church. I, I wouldn't have anything because the enemy had a master plot and plan. But there came a man and his wife and his wife. His wife is just as powerful as he is. His wife is just as anointed as he is. And they... They loved us back to life. He poured living water into me. He loved me. He helped me. He straightened me out. He helped Sharice. They loved us through crisis. And we will never, ever, ever forget the vine that went beyond the wall. And I just really want to say that Anthony Magnum and Mike Williams and all of these phenomenal preachers. God's promise to you is that as you go beyond the walls, you don't change or compromise anything you believe. But as you go beyond the walls, God will give you double inside here. And there are men out there and there are women out there who need your voice, who need your anointing who need your message who need to drink from your well because there's nothing like it and I love you 
I love you, feed us. You're not alone. We're not going to leave you alone. We will never leave you alone. You are part of us. Tommy Tenney, I love you like a brother. And you'll never be alone. And Terry, I love you. I love your grand, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and I honor you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you peace because you sure gave it to us in our darkest night. We love you. Love you too, Jensen. Love you, Dad. Love you, church. Love you, Jesus. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. That's Second Kings chapter 8, verse 4. In the stilted language of King James and the more easily versed colloquial language of the message Bible the king asked Gehazi the question this way he says tell me some stories of the great things that Elisha did. The reason he asked that question of Gehazi is because Gehazi was in a unique position as the lifelong servant of, Gehazi was the lifelong servant of Elisha. I don't know that I was the lifelong servant of my dad, but I've been the lifelong son of my dad. So perhaps that uniquely positions me to tell some stories about my dad. The tentacles of his ministry were long enough to reach around the world, but short enough to wrap around our home. And I bet no one here today knows how good he could dance. All of these dignified photographs that they have been placing on these screens leave one particular aspect of his life uh, un, um, just unresolved for you. That around his kids
kids and his grandkids, well, as we say in Louisiana, he would let his hair down, which for him that wasn't very much. He would make this statement, I bet you didn't know I could do this. And at that point, he would bust some moves <laughs> that were the absolute worst dance moves you have ever seen in your life. But to his grandkids, <laughs> it was delightful. And to, uh, to the delight of the rehab center he was living in, <laughs> one day, about two weeks ago, he told my mom, somehow there was some music playing and uh, my dad, with all of his spirituality, he never got delivered from a mischievous streak <laughs> that just could not be prayed out of him. And I, for one, am glad that he never lost that because it lets the rest of us know that you don't have to be sanctimonious to be spiritual. That you can be normal and spiritual. In fact, only a privileged few of you here, you, you've heard the incredible preaching of Bishop T.F. Tenney. But very, very few of you here have ever heard the incredible, skillful storytelling ability of Bishop T.F. Tenney as he weaves the narrative of Goofy Mickey and the garbage pail story. I can't hold a candle to that. While all of you here tonight call him Bishop, the highest honorific title he was ever bestowed was Dad. Or perhaps even Papa, because about 30 years ago he started saying to me and my sister if he'd known how great grandkids were he would have had them first <laughs> and then to the dismay of the grandkids when the great-grandkids came along, he told the grandkids if he'd known how great the great-grandkids were, he would have had them first. Uh, my dad was an unmatched investor. I don't know if you know that. Warren Buffett was no match for him. He invested in property, literally, uh, to make sure, to, and to ensure that we would always spend time together as family. The first extravagant purchase he made to ensure that we would spend time together as a family was a fish camp on the Bayou Beth. 
in the expensive area to the east of Columbia, Louisiana. In the just just west, or just south of Abair. I don't know if any of you know where Abair, Louisiana is. It's not on your GPS. Uh, it's close to Mr. Mott's bait camp. The Bayou Beff fish camp had no air conditioning. Uh, in fact, it had no hot water. Uh, it, uh, it had a chipped pink bathtub that was parked at a judicious angle on a screened porch in the back, on, on the back porch that the only way you got hot water to it is my mom had to heat hot water on the stove. My sister and I had to share hot water at this luxurious fish camp. But we spent time together. I learned how to scale fish. That place could be affectionately called a sweat box. I learned how to clean fish if we caught fish. And that's a big if. Because my dad used to say that he could sell tickets to the fish to, to watch us. He could sell tickets to the fish just to watch us in the boat trying to fish. He could sell tickets to the fish to raise money for She's for Christ. Because my sister would be playing Barbie dolls in the bottom of the boat while my mom would, uh, was probably the best uh, fisher woman and my dad in his straw hat and heaven help us if we drifted up under a limb that had a snake on it. And I, the memories that, that I have of that, but 50 years later, there, there's a, a house in Branson on, on a golf course, and we're still going there as families to spend time together. And, and, and it's really not about a house. It's all about the time, because he prioritized family above anybody here. The one thing I can tell you that I never had to compete with you for my dad's attention. I never had to compete with any church for my dad's attention. I never had to compete with any district function or any conference. At times he had to be gone for my birthday. Uh, at, my, at my house right now and I've got a, a little memento box that's still on my uh, uh, dresser at home. There's just some things I've, I always know where they are. I've known where they are for I'm 62, and I've known where they are for uh, for f over uh, 50 years. And I've, I've just some things I've always known where they are. And one of those things is a, 
a telegram that I got when I was 14 years old when my dad was in, in, in India. He couldn't make it home for my birthday. And I don't know if you understand the days before cell phones when you're charged for every word, but it was, hi son, I'm in India. And to get a telegram out, that meant you had to drive to wherever, Bob Rodenbush could tell you, but you had to drive to a place where you could get every word out and it was metered and just to make sure that the telegram could get delivered and he wanted to make sure that even though he knew and I knew ahead of time he wasn't going to be there, it didn't bother me that he wasn't there, but I still have the telegram. I never felt shortchanged. I felt honored because if the United States of America can send a secretary of state around the world, then the kingdom of heaven can have diplomats to serve. And I was honored that my dad was a diplomat. He started taking me on diplomatic missions when I was age 12. I became a global citizen. He taught, taught me something that then allowed me to model something that, that I began to take my children at age 12. They became global citizens that, that now they can find their way around London without a map. They can jump on the tube. And they know their way around the cities of the world. If you're going to impact the world, you have to know the world. I learned things at a young age. I learned about the prince of darkness and the power of light and why you should always close the windows and that there were no foxes under my bed when I was eight years old. I know that sounds like a jumble of things to you, but every eight-year-old should know those things. First of all, I thought there were foxes under my bed. That meant that you, if you have foxes under your bed, you can't just walk up to your bed and get in bed because they bite your toes when you walk up to the bed. So that means you have to take a running leap to jump in bed. Every kid has certain fears, but uh, that was just my fear. You know, things that go bump in the night and, and the darkness in the closet. And then there's, there's, there's real fears. And I'll never forget the night that I was eight years old, and not just foxes under the bed, but darkness came in my house. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying these things because they were absolutely true. The prince of darkness came into my room as sure as I'm standing here, and as sure as I know the voice of God and. I was awakened by the prince of darkness as the window over my bed, a black blob came into my room, covered me like a blanket, woke me up as a terror in the night. I could not breathe. I felt absolute terror. I jumped up and like any kid, the only thing you know to do, run and jump in the middle between your mom and dad. How many of you did the same thing? 
When I did that, my dad woke up and he immediately realized what had happened because perhaps it was even that day that he had just returned and my mom's nodding her head that it was that day. I'm, I'm only eight and all I know is something came in the window. He realized what had just happened that an, an evil spirit had followed him home from India. And he knew that what he had to do was close the window. And with me following him, he said, come on, son, we've got to close the windows. And as casually as he could, he went to every door and every window in our house and he just went through the house and he said, I plead the blood. 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 And he said, son, I just came back from India and the evil spirit followed me and I'm sorry I didn't close the windows and I, it's okay now. You can go to bed. And I learned about the prince of darkness and the power of light <laughs> and I was able to go back to sleep and from eight years old I learned you have nothing to fear he shared the delicious recipe for the secret sauce of loving one woman deeply for the entirety of one's life. Thank you, Dad. He, we lightheartedly competed about how many countries each other had preached in right outside that door to the left hand side there's a little uh, plaque with pins in it that came from his house or the office and uh, I can tell you how many pins there are in there it's 115 because he kept reminding me and I've only reached 70 Maybe now, Dad, I'll catch up. He left me with a, a goal more important than amassing money. And that is reaching the world. He taught me about that making memories was more important than buying souvenirs. <laughs> Some of these memories I'll never forget. I'll never forget the memory of the alcoholic monkey. <laughs> we were in Puerto Vallarta and uh, it was a I wouldn't call it a zoo. It was one monkey in a cage. Oh, there was a lion. I'm sorry, I forgot the lion. And uh, my dad leaned in to look at the monkey. And the monkey stole his glasses. And it was just chain link fence and, the, and, the, and it had just a little 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 slip lock that, I, that anybody could open and my dad just went around the side and he's, he was aggravated because the, the monkey just stole his glasses and threw them over in the corner and my dad just went and, and, and opened the gate and went, went inside the chain link fence and went 
to reach for his glasses and that monkey climbed up his leg and bit him four times. <laughs> and my dad closed the gate and, and, <laughs> and called for the management and said, that, that monkey bit me, little bitty monkey. And, and the man said, oh, okay, no problem. We know what to do. In a few minutes, the, the man came down with a pina colada. <laughs> Not a virgin pina colada. And my dad thought it was for him. <laughs> my dad said, no, no, I don't, I, I don't need that. I just need my glasses. And he said, no, sir, that, that's not for you. That's for the monkey. And he said, well, well, what do you mean? He said, no, the monkey will steal anything he can off of people when they lean in. He'll steal a lady's necklace. He'll steal glasses. He's an alcoholic monkey. And he steals things so he can get his pina coladas. And the only way we can get it back from him is bring him his pina coladas. So we brought him his pina coladas and we'll give it to him so now we can go in and get your glasses. My dad had to go get rabies shots because of the alcoholic monkey and we've never forgot. We don't need souvenirs. We have memories. Alcoholic monkeys. He took us places. Let us live things. Have you ever woke up in the morning cold because your spouse stole the covers? This past Saturday was my first morning that I woke up uncovered because my dad was not there to pray for me as he had every day for the past 62 years of my life it felt cold Sunday was almost as difficult as Friday, the day of his death. I woke up Saturday, it was cold because I felt uncovered. Friday was difficult, the day of his death. And Sunday was even almost just as difficult because there's a tradition. I woke up Sunday morning, my phone gets charged beside the bed and I instinctively, I reached for my phone and it's habit, out of habit, I reach for my phone and the first thing I look for is the text from my dad because every Sunday morning I get a text from my dad. And it's short, it's just something like, preach good, have great church, praying for you. And... After I reached for my phone and, and, and flipped it over, it dawned on me, I'm not going to get that text. And I realized I'm, I'm not ever going to get that text again. And it hurt. And I posted something about it. And much to my amazement, I found out I'm not the only one that he was sending those texts to. In fact, how many, how many, anybody else in here was he sending texts like that to? Hold your hand up. Hold your hand up. Come on. (laughs) 
And I posted that, and I must have got over 150. He never told me that. That's my dad. He made everybody feel like you're the only one. I thought he was doing it because I'm his son. I haven't yet preached since he's been gone. Between now and this next Sunday, um, I'm I'm pretty positive of this. He caught the chariot. That means the mantle is still floating in the air. I miss his prayers. I didn't get the text. The mantle's floating. I'm going to try to catch it. But I think that I think that there's a bunch of us going to try to catch it. And I I'm, I I shouted after that that chariot and I said, "Hey, hey. Don't forget." As much as it is within a son to inherit what a father can give, the next time I step up to speak, I'm positive I'm going to have his support. Night before last, I was helping my mom clean out his closet. I took the liberty of trying on a pair of my dad's shoes. I'm not saying that I or anyone else will ever fill a pair of my dad's shoes. But I am wearing them tonight. But I had to wear two pair of socks. (laughs) And I encourage anybody else we got some growing to do. But if God can call a 16-year-old boy from Bullgard Parish and do with him what he did with T.F. Tenney, he can do something with you. Let's go get it. start for heaven I could only find one way a road that led me through
today to stay down here to be close to daddy I want to first say thank you for all the miles you've driven thank you for the money you've spent and the time you've invested to come honor my father he loved you it didn't take long being with my dad to know where his heartbeat really was. And you were his heartbeat. I don't know if you really understand the depth and the breadth that my dad would reach. But my dad was comfortable with presidents, with governors, and with little kids. It didn't matter your state in life, and it didn't matter your name (laughs) or what your pedigree was. Daddy just simply didn't care. My daddy loved people. He loved people. And I 
have heard many accolades of his today. And they're all true. My dad was an orator. He was an author. He was an administrator. He was a mentor. And he was a friend. But today, all I have to say is I was his little girl. I stand here today, a grown woman with five grandchildren, but it never, ever failed. The minute I rocked in a room with my dad, oh, daddy's little girl's here. I always knew he loved me. And the man that was with me the longest, that gave me the most memories, has now become a memory. And all the things that he instilled And not only me, but in all of you. Our warrior may have gone before us. Our warrior may have laid down his shield. But his light still shines in every one of you. Because he loved you. And I'm not going to be the accolades of all the things that he did because... I just wanted to stand here today as his little girl. And I really have no words to say, except, Daddy, I'm sure going to miss you. I took for granted when to hear your voice was just a call away. What I'd give for just some time to share the things that slipped my mind. There's so really like to say But I can never go back then To do the things we did back then I'll store those precious memories in my mind small are now gold 
in a memory vault and I'll cherish everyone I have of you now I can see and recognize the part you played to shape my life and I often see you in the things I do God's design and master plan He saw the hurting hearts of man As we would say goodbye To those so dear Could we do that? Isn't God good? I think we ought to give a big hand clap and shout in honor of Brother Tenney and his life. We ought to give praise to God for the things that he has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I give you honor for this great man. Let the anointing of God touch our lives tonight in a great way. God bless you. you. May be seated to Brother and Sister Bernard, to Brother Mooney and Brother and Sister Jones, and to our general board, to our speakers and singers. You were just tremendous. To our distinguished guests from our church, our city, and our state, and the hundreds of ministers and wives and my dear friends that should be speaking and me sitting with the family along with all the missionaries and their wives. Brother Tenney was something else. We were at a funeral one time, and this preacher was getting ready to preach, and it, it said, homily. And I said, what is a homily? He said, that's a short message. <laughs> so after tonight, I think I know it will, I'm going to change mine from a message to a homily, if you don't mind. But, you know, he always had his saying when he started funerals. He said, especially when we were honoring a patriarch, he would start with these words. Traditional Jewish mourning is seven days. He said, Deuteronomy 34 and 8, the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. He said, it takes time to bury a patriarch. It took 110 days in Egypt to have Jacob's funeral. And then we traveled to Canaan and had a funeral for seven more days. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take 20 or 30 more minutes. Flags that have mast tell the nation's loss. But there are no symbols or words that can tell the love and sorrow that fill our hearts tonight in this sanctuary. And yet, out of the depths of our grief arise the feelings of the truest gratitude and thanksgiving and shouts of praise for the nobility of example, the uncommon leadership of our peerless, fearless, leader's life. There is no death for such as T.F. Tenney. If the Lord tarries, the ages to come will revere his name. 
For unnumbered generations of the children of men shall rise up to call him our blessed hero. His anointed words and mighty works and acts, that impeccable character, will go on to bless the lives of the generations that are to follow. And that which seems death to our eyes was simply his translation from the lower to the heavenly. He shall be remembered forever. He shall be alive forever. He shall be speaking forever. And the people both now and tomorrow shall hear him forever. To Sister Tenny, our first lady for 27 years, to Tommy and his wife Jeannie and Terry and her hus husband Steve and to you five outstanding grandchildren, Shane, Shannon, Tiffany, Natasha, and Andra, Andrea, and nine great-grandchildren and all your families. He loved each of you to death. You were the center of his universe and he would have laid down everything for y'all's lives. And Pam, no, you are from another planet. And to the members of his extended family, to this great POA church, without dispute, the United Pentecostal Church International and the evangelical circles around the world have suffered this great, great loss. This homegoing tonight of T.F. Tenney, one of the greatest Christian leaders and champions of expository preaching and mentor to not only preachers and leaders of the United Pentecostal Church, but also to evangelical leaders of this generation. Let me pause to add, if you don't mind, there are some here tonight and not present with us that are now baptizing in the name of Jesus and filled with the Spirit because of Brother Tenney reaching out beyond the United Pentecostal Church. To all of you thousands that are watching by way of the web and those of you gathered in this sanctuary, we're all of one mind that not one of us tonight, nor all of us together, can crown this great man. For the memory of 70 years of ministry, for him was a 16-year-old teenager, which, by the way, when I received the text, I asked for it to come and I'm not comfortable behind this pulpit because I've never spoken from behind this pulpit. But when I found out that Brother Smith had it, he brought it from Illinois. This is the first pulpit that Brother Tenney preached behind in DeRitter, Louisiana. So I consider it a great honor as his pastor to stand here tonight knowing that he wasn't physically right the last few days, but spiritually, he finished strong. He kept the faith. He stayed the course. And he crossed the finish line in a blaze of glory. A week ago Sunday in that chair where you see those rows there, he held high the truth and the torch for the sake of time, though I'd planned. I'm not going to play that tonight. But man, he prophesied over us that you want to see that clip. To the people of diverse backgrounds and creeds and culture, the pulpit was his throne, and he filled it like a king. And the pulpit was the world, and he could say with the Apostle Paul, I have magnified my office. Eternity alone will reveal the impact of this powerful, anointed preaching, and his unforgettable sermons. In life, a good fortune, he valued above all else. Brother Tenney's value was on the God-given gift of the most talented anointed wife, Thetis Corn Tenney, that a man could have. <laughs> Sister Tenney, you're a powerful teacher, you're anointed preacher, you're a skilled administrator. You have the gift of government. Together, I want to pause and let the United Pentecostal Church understand what has walked among us 
lest we take it for granted. They pioneered an incredible number of programs that's going to shock you when I start naming them that have become funnel mill ministries of the United Pentecostal Church. This couple, I can't talk about Brother Tenney without talking about Sister Tenney. This couple began the first youth camp. This couple began Bible quizzing. This couple began the first youth congress that had 35,000 at it this past summer. This couple began the first women's conference. This couple began the first men's conference. This couple began the first singles ministry. This couple began the first district music department. This couple began the first all-state youth choir. This couple began the first all-state talent competition. All these programs came from TF and Theta's Tenney. That's amazing. Men's conference in every district. That's Brother Tinney. Women's conference. That's Sister Tinney. That's amazing. Louisiana and the Tinneys would lead. And all other districts would just follow. One of the biggest things he started, Brother Rodenbush, was what you recognize was our partner in mission program. All because they were a man and wife team that had a vision. And they were path makers that other of us were able to follow, so close and so dependent on each other. President Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, for eight years said this, the president passed through a thousand crowded places during his career, but there was only one person who could make him lonely by just leaving the room, and that was his wife, Nancy. And that was true of brother and sister Tinney. There was only one person that can make him lonely by just leaving the room. And that was you, sister Tinney, and your two cups of coffee every day. He wanted you by his side, and you stayed there. And as your pastor, I give you honor. You stood by your man. And this United Pentecostal Church, sister Tinney, gives you honor for your great life tonight. You're an unbelievable lady. You may be seated. Everyone in this room owned a piece of them. You have many teachers, but not many followers. Mike and Debbie and I were together last week, and when it all happened, Debbie just simply said, it's like I lost my father. And for 15 years, Mike, you had him there for Father's Day, and as his pastor, I appreciate that. They've counseled us. They've encouraged us. They befriended us. They fought battles for us. He identified with us in good times and bad times. And oh, the counsel of this wise giant. Especially since I lost my father. He always had a word of wisdom about whatever dilemma I was in. He always made you feel better. Brother Tinney always made you feel important. He never descended or talked down to you. And what was great about him is, if I said, Brother Tenney, I need to talk to you about, we need to swim the river together with this, I knew it was confidential enough that it would not even be going to Sister Tenney. He was a confident. We're all in their debt. He could walk in a general board room. I only had the privilege of serving there two years as executive president. But I watched and observed as you did such a great job handling that meeting. But when we reached crisis and when the temperature was rising, every general board member started to bank up. Let's hear what Brother Tenney has to say about it. Let Brother Tenney cast his verdict on it. And without fail, whether it was in a general boardroom or whether it was on our conference floor, when Brother Tenney got through, we all felt at peace. Brother Tenney came into Pentecost and he became the bridge from those great men, our pioneers, our founders of the Pentecostal movement. And the later generation, he bridged us together. The knowledge that this man has of the history of this district and 
where it all began for the Jesus name movement and the, the latter day down all the way from the Quincy up through Kinder. Those great places he knew these churches and the people of this district. He was just legendary. He, he considered, and we considered him the, the resident historian. He, he was something else. He knew Louisiana. Now, lest you think that I think that the only thing he could do is walk on water, let me break it down to some carnal things about Brother Tenney in this organization. He knew the political landscape and the politics of the United Pentecostal Church. He was as savvy as any man I've ever seen in the political arena of the United Pentecostal Church. So my generation, we named Brother Urshan, whom you all know I love dearly and had the privilege of speaking at his funeral. We decided Brother Urshan was the godfather and that Brother Tenney and Brother Connell and Brother Lumpkin was the Illuminati. <laughs> One time I went and I got there early for a day and they came out of the general board meeting and my father-in-law, Brother Lumpkin, and Brother Tenney and Brother Connell were we're eating dinner together or lunch together, and I went and sat down with them, and I'd been in the lobby a little bit, and I said, man, I think Brother Urshan may be in trouble. I said, I'm worried about it. And my father-in-law, still dealing with a, probably a little arrogant young son-in-law, he looked at me and said, he may be in trouble with the fellas you run with, but he's not in trouble with this organization. <laughs> he said, your crew don't run this organization. I said, so you mean it's run by the dead and unrevivalists, don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and you could pick their burden up with a pair of tweezers? <laughs> Brother Tenney's glasses came off. He said, son, the book of James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. From that time on, I knew that I had to be nice. Brother Tenney knew everything, Scott. He knew when you were at camp meeting. He sits there with a book. And if you wasn't there, he'd call you. He knew when you wasn't at camp meeting. He knew if you wasn't at district conference. He knew if you hadn't signed the affirmation statement. So you had to be good for goodness sake. He knew everything. He knew everything. He would sit on that plan for He was just something else. He was famous for his one-liners. It's a mighty thin pancake that doesn't have two sides. Main thing to keep the main thing the main thing. If you can't say amen, look amen. In life, one either dies young or he dies ugly. There are some people who belong to the Hallelujah, What's It To You Club. <laughs> Instead of fishers of men, some of you have become keepers of the aquarium. Too many churchgoers who are singing, standing on the promises while they're sitting on the premises. <laughs> and he was famous for those tweets. On eternity, to do the most good on earth, think the most about eternity. He tweeted out, whole with a loose grasp. Anything that is not eternal. The game we're in is the Super Bowl, the Indy 500, the World Series, all rolled up in one. We win this one or else. The win or loss is eternal. There is no cheat sheet for the judgment seat of Christ. The exams are taken, graded, and in before you ever get there. We all die. The goal isn't living forever. It is to create something that will. At the end of the road, whether you're in life, whether you're on the broad or the narrow, you're going to meet the same person at the end. Goodbye here is hello there. Earth's sunset is heaven's sunrise. The release of the temple leads to the grasp of the eternal. He said treasures in heaven laid up only as treasures in earth are laid down. Jesus is coming soon. Who will be caught up with him? Those who are caught up with him now. David crossed on a ferry. Elijah crossed in a chariot. Angels, angels took Lazarus. I wonder what the God of diversity will send after me. 
Death can't kill what won't die. A dead saint is more alive than a living sinner. If my departed loved ones are with him, he's with me, then we are awfully very close. When he talked about his age, he said, getting old is the hardest job I've ever had. I'm just grateful that so far I've been successful at it. I was recently introduced as an icon. I told them last time I checked the dictionary, an icon was an antique religious relic. I guess I qualified. <laughs> You're only as old when your memory exceeds your dreams. My problem is I have a 2017 Rolls Royce engine and a 1933 Model A body. <laughs> the measure of a man is how he handles power. Once you become sold out to Christ, you become a bestseller because you're the book that everybody wants to read. Smallest deed is better than the greatest intention. Any man who is too big to sweep the platform is too little to stand on it. Man can be too big for God to use but never too small. It is your job to humble yourself. I love this one. It is God's job to promote you. If you insist on doing God's job, he will do your job. I will admit some days I feel like a Shetland pony in the Kentucky Derby. You cannot live a perfect day without something for someone who will never be able to repay. Ministry, love people more than you love preaching. The finals will be giving at the judgment seat of Christ. Preaching, for God's sake, preach. Not philosophy or speculation. Don't promise a banquet and serve cool will. Preach until hell rattles and the church is revived. No man with wet eyes will ever preach a dry sermon. Preach ever sermon like your son was sitting on the back seat giving church one last chance. The leader is mentioned only six times in the Bible, but servant is mentioned 900 times. It is not the great come mission, it's the great go mission. Oh, those unforgettable sermons. Regardless of your creed, your color, or your condition, those of us that could be backed into the corner of the circumstances of life always found hope and new reason for living. Those in the midnight of discouragement we found hope and encouragement, salvation, and healing. And when my pastor stepped to the pulpit, whatever the occasion, it was like all state insurance. You knew you were in good hands if T.F. Tenney was in the pulpit. He signed off every minister's funeral that I ever attended with these words. I will speak the last thing over this man that will be spoken and hear the words. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And today I speak that over my pastor's life. You may be seated. I'm going to skip some other stuff to reduce this from a message to a homily, and I'm about done. But in the final words, please indulge me to go a little personal here just a moment. Mickey and I and our family have been privileged and blessed for all of our lives to be acquainted with the Tennies. Their friends sit here, Kenneth and Wanda, brother and sister Kraft, many more that I can name, but they... These people, as I honored them at BOTT, they were my heroes. And I looked to these people as the example that I wanted to follow. But the last two and a half years, when God directed me to bring Brother and Sister Tinney on staff at the POA, they gave us a distilled essence of their lives. Some of the greatest staff devotions, he would sit there, we'd get him, and he would speak to our staff. There'd be staggering words. I just wish I could I'd sit there and say, oh, God, I wish the whole general conference could hear this. I wish BOTT could hear what this man is spitting out to the staff. I cannot tell you the inestimable worth of each visit or call, meeting with them. It caused the flame 
to burn more brightly in my heart and in my preaching both here and around the world. Sister Tenney, something you don't know that I will tell you now, but in the last year, Brother Tenney called Mickey and I twice. And he said, I want to see you, Pastor. And he said, I don't want to see you at church. I want to see you at your home. And he said, don't be in a hurry. He said, I need a minimum of an hour. I said, okay, Brother Tenney, come on. So he came, walked in, and, and he said, uh, I'm on staff here. And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you need to use me more. He said, you got all this counseling, and he said, I can take a lot of that off of you. I said, I know, Brother Tenney. I said, but the problem is, Brother Tenney, we've been taking you to the hospital in ambulances. <laughs> and he got so tickled. He just started dying laughing. He said, you know, that's the truth. <laughs> no wonder I haven't been able to counsel. I said, the only place I could send him would be to your hospital room. Yeah, he was so funny. He said, then, I'm worried about you paying me and this staff paying me. I said, Brother Tenney, if you will just keep breathing, I will keep paying you. Your knowledge, your wealth, what you have given to my generation, what you offered to this church, I can never pay you enough. And he left. And he called me a few weeks later. He said, I, I, need you to come, I need to come back to that same meeting. I want Mickey there. Because Mickey wanted Mickey at everything. In our wedding, if you'll remember, Kenneth, I got mixed up, Mike. And I said I was going to say simply Mickey. And I said simply Mickley. So he always called Mickey Mickley after our wedding. So <laughs> I said, come on, Brother Tinney. And so... He said, I just got a favor to ask. He said, I don't know how much longer I have. Mickey can vouch for all this. He said, I just ask you if I go before she does, please take care of Thetis. He said, make sure she goes to camps and make sure she goes to conferences. He said, make sure you take care of Thetis. So Sister Tenney, it won't just be Pastor and Mick. You got a whole congregation and men on this platform that our goal is to make sure that you stay in the middle of everything at POA and the United Pentecostal Church. <clears throat> he told me that God sent him to POA to guard my anointing. And I called him Friday at 1247. And uh, I said, Brother Tenney, I love you. He said, I love you. And then Mickey spoke up. He said, I love you, baby. He, he loved Mickey. And I said, Brother Tenney, I'm going to pray for you. And this is going to be a very strange prayer. <laughs> but I'm going to pray if God's not going to raise you up to release you. And the family was gathered around the bed. And I went into a tongue in the Holy Ghost. And I began to pray a release from my pastor. And two hours later, he was on the sunny banks of sweet deliverance. <clears throat> There's a whole void that's there. A few years ago, he came to me. He said, I, I don't know where I'm going to be buried. And I said, well, we can figure that out. He said, I said, let's me and you and Mickey and Sister Tinny drive to DeRitter. And we'll find a place where you want to be buried. And, you know, we'll take care of that. He said, I, I want to be buried here. I said, okay. I said, let's go out to where our plots are. And so I took him out to Forest Lawn where we'll go in the morning from this place about 9.30. And I said, sir, find them the plots. I would like it in front of the Bible. And there they found them two plots. Kenneth there by Brother and Sister Lumpkin and Mom and Pop Phillips and my dad and Brother and Sister and my grandparents and We've got plots there. Tomorrow, we'll go to Graveside that me and POA had the privilege of buying the plots of two of the greatest saints you'll ever want to meet in my pastor and wife.
when he was elected district superintendent of Louisiana District. The Alexandria Town Talk printed an article announcing his election. They quoted Brother Tenney in his acceptance remarks saying, Tenney declared that peace and progress have been hallmarks of the Louisiana district. He said, I don't look at my office as anything but a servant. I want to be able to say when God is through with me that it was peace and progress. Brother Tenney, as your pastor, I can stand here today and say now that your ministry as far as flesh and blood is concerned is over. You accomplished your task and you will hear him say, well done. In 2 Samuel 19, 31 through 40, there is a great man by the name of Barzillai. He had conducted King David over Jordan. And when David was driven from the throne, he provided the king with sustenance. And the king said unto Barzillai, Come over with me, and I will feed thee in Jerusalem. You can sit at my table with me. You can share my inheritance in the city of Jerusalem. And the dialogue that takes place is amazing between David and Barzillai. It is said to be one of the most beautiful stories that is written on the pages of history. Barzillai said, Thank you, Majesty. I am honored, O King, but I don't have long to live. Today is my birthday, and I'm 80 years old, and I can't think like I once could. I can't taste what I eat or what I drink. I'm getting tired and I'm weary and I'm weak and I'm feeble. I don't want to be a burden unto my Lord the King. I'll go a little ways over Jordan with you to protect you and strengthen you. You don't need to reward me. I pray thee, just let me go back to my homeland, back to my community where I was raised and just find a place for me to be buried along with Thetis. But King, your honor, if it would not offend you, I would like to ask that my son Keham and my children, if you would let him go over, King, with you, and you do to him whatever you were going to do for me, if you would do that to my children. King David said, Barzillai, your children shall go over with me, and I will do to them that which seemed good unto thee. That will I do for thee. Count on it. It's the word of a king. Where the word of the king is, there is power, and he did. And King David kissed Barzillai, and he blessed Barzillai. And Barzillai returned to his old home place to get ready to go to his brand new home. But David took his children with him to Jerusalem. It's amazing when you look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7, and he is bringing it all down, and David is at his last words. I mean, when he's bringing everything to an end. I mean, you say a lot of things when you're on your deathbed, and when he is at his last words to his son Solomon, the king who was going to take his place. He simply says, Show kindness to the family of Barzillai the Gideite, for he was a very great man. And when I helped him, he returned that. So I'm asking you, Solomon, when you start giving out all the rewards and you start honoring people, Remember Barzillai the Gileadite, for he was a very great man. Brother Tinney was a great man. And according to God's eternal unchanging word, whatsoever this man prayed or asked the Lord for concerning his family, the Lord said, 
that will I do for thee. Count it. God remembers. All the good works and mighty deeds will be visited upon you even unto many generations because of Barzillai T.F. Tenney. Many years later, when you're thumbing through Nehemiah 7 and Ezra 6, you come across a priestly clan in the Word of God. And that priestly clan was called the children of Barzillai. All because he took care of the king in the years to come. Tommy and Jeannie, Steve and Terry, the legacy of T.F. Tinney. Friday, death claimed his soul. Excuse me. Death claimed his body. God claimed his soul. But now the living is to preserve and protect the legacy of those that have gone before us. And tonight, I stand here as one who has a legacy of G.A. Mangan. And many of you sit here with a legacy of fathers and mothers that have given us things that are precious and dear to our lives that are so very, very important. And Tommy and Jeannie, Steve and Terry, you five grandchildren, God, Shane, you're one of the most gifted teachers. You have blessed POA in such a great way. The anointing of your grandfather, the man, you ought to hear Shane Spears teach. The only thing happened to that legacy. This was my pastor and I'm his pastor. Don't let anything happen to that legacy. Hold on to that truth. Hold on to that legacy. Hold on to the things that your fathers taught you. Hold on to the doctrines that your father taught you. Let him remember how many times, Hero is of the Lord our God is one, and besides him there is no other. Repent and be baptized in that name. Hold on to those doctrines for the sake of Barzillai. It's not long, folks. It's, it's about over here. Those of you planning to stay down here a long time, we're going to pray for all y'all, but we're getting ready to get out of here. The bride's just about to leave this place. The trumpet of God's getting ready to sound. Better get everything in order and everything right. It's time the Lord's getting ready to come after us. He's going to take us. Brother Tinney's not just going to a better place. The Bible said he's going to a far better place. We misquote that scripture. We say a better place. The Bible said it's far better. Today, my pastor's in a far better place today. He's in a far better place. As I would do, and he did. We preached those funerals. One of the last ones I remember was Billy Cole's funeral. He was in it. You know, his shoulders would get to going, whoa, whoa. You know, he'd get to saying, and the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel. Whoa, I feel it right now. And then he would go into that last line, and he walked sitting down. I didn't know what to do. I mean, he walked to the chair. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Let me look at you, great body of minister, to the general board, to all you speakers, and let me declare to you, he's more alive today than he's ever been. Brother Tinney is alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Yes, won't it be wonderful there? Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing God's praises. Everybody will be happy over there. Yes, everybody will be happy. Goodbye.
goodbye 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 hallelujah i'm gone well when you see jesus coming yes in the sky goodbye hallelujah i'm gone oh i'll fly away oh glory yes i'll fly away in the morning yes when i die hallelujah by and by oh i'll fly away give him praise everybody give him praise everybody give him praise i thank you great god i give you glory and praise for the things that you have done there's nobody like you jesus thank you for the life of brother Timmy. You know, it's late. I didn't go very long. It's late. But I, I, I don't think I could close without doing it. Kevin, I don't know if you need it. That thing's always out of key when I sing. <laughs> but I'd like to sing his anthem. Mickey, would you come get a mic? And I want to just sing, and I'm going to take Sister Tinny out. We will, be, we will meet here in the morning at 930 here in the sanctuary at 930. And we'll be going the graveside together. If you want to get in the lineup, if you'll get behind their, their cars, uh, the fan would love to have you. It's not a private. It's for everyone that whosoever will would love to have you. But I don't think this service would be complete if we didn't sing all hell the power of Jesus' name. I think that's what he'd want some. Would you help me do that, Mick? Oh, hell the Upon you. I'm going to take the family. God bless you.